Hello everyone. My name is Sonia Agrawal. I'm a research scientist in the Laboratory of Applied Computational Genomics at Frickin, Japan. Today, I'm going to talk about my project where, as part of Phantom 6, we are focusing on exploring the biological role of long non-coding RNAs using high C data. Thousands of LNC RNAs are known to be transcribed across different cell types. However, if we look into the literature, 96% of them are still functionally unannotated, demonstrating a major gap in the knowledge. The individual studies have shown that lnc are involved in different functions, which include transcription and translation regulation, chromatin remodeling, and so on. Therefore, to explore the role of lnc in different cell types, we have used the HiC data to identify the protein coding genes that are in close proximity of a lnc and use this uh, information to infer its biological role. If you are not aware of HiC method, basically it is a technique to identify all the genomic region that are interacting with each other in a selected cell type. To start the analysis, we have uniformly processed deep sequence HiC data for different cell types, which include in-house gener data uh, generated for IPS and dermal fibroblasts, together with data by ENCODE and other individual studies. Once we identified the significant interactions, we mapped the express promoter identified using match gauge data to obtain the annotated interaction for downstream analysis. One of such analyses showed us that different promoter pairs are non-randomly present compared to the same type of promoter pair in mRNA coding and intergenic lnc gene pair. This is not restricted to one cell type, but is true for all the selected cell types, showing that is a, uh, is a general feature of the interaction. Overall, this shows that the mRNA coding intergenic lnc and gene pair are non-randomly spatially co-localized due to their regulatory role. Uh, next, we generated gene clusters by selecting the genomic region that are up to three high C interaction away from lnc window. Gene these gene clusters were used for various different uh, downstream analysis. One of such analysis we performed was gene ontology, gene ontology analysis for each cluster. The research shows that up to 58% of lnc has at least one enriched geoterm depending on the cell type. Further comparison between the high C cluster and the linear cluster shows that high C cluster can annotate many more lnc compared to the linear cluster. Overall, this shows that the information contained by the high C cluster is distinctive and cannot be recapitulated by a linear cluster. Further, we looked into the association between the lnc lineage and high C interactions. We found that number of interacting mRNA coding promoters increases from human specific to the older lnc -RNAs. Further, geoterm associated with human specific lnc RNA high C clusters are more cell type specific compared to the older lnc -RNAs. As shown here, in, for Hubert, human-specific lnc show enrichment for terms like cell adhesion, platelet activation, while older lnc are enriched in the term related to the response to metal ion. Overall, this shows that human-specific lnc have more cell death specific function, while older antigenic lnc have more ubiquitous function. Altogether, we can use these uh, information uh, to annotate an unannotated lnc -RNAs. Here is an example of un unannotated lnc -RNA, which is specifically expressed in HEPG2. Its cluster is enriched in uh, uh, different blood-associated geoterms. The lnc -RNA has a positive correlation with the geogenes, which belong to the gene family known to be involved in blood coagulation. Further, the GWAS analysis shows the enrichment of traits associated with blood uh, regulation in AP compartment that overlaps with the high C cluster of the lnc -RNA. Overall, this suggests that uh, this lnc -RNA may have a role in blood co uh, coagulation. Further, we are developing a high C visualization website, which will provide a platform to explore the role of lnc -RNA by combining all different analysis generated in this project. Overall, this project provides a platform to explore the function of hundreds of intergenic lnc RNA expressed across selected 18 cell types. And this is not restricted to just intergenic lnc RNA, but also extended to the other lnc RNA showing the strength of the, of the project. In the end, I would like to thank my boss, Dr. Mikhail Duhun, together with my lab members and uh, all the collaborators for their support and their analysis for this project. Last but not the least, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and I'm looking forward for your comments and questions in the Slack channel. Thank you.
Um, I would like to start by um, thanking the uh, organizers for this wonderful meeting and the opportunity to present our work uh, on a uh, 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 harmonized scalable functional genomics data repository. Um, uh, as we all know, uh, typical uh, genomic workflows require querying multiple and often large scale uh, genomic data sources uh, uh, where, uh, where the results uh, uh, of these queries are then uh, linked, uh, filtered and summarized um, across these data sources. However, the functional uh, uh, genomic data required for this analysis is uh, uh, distributed across many data sources. Um, individual data sets are generated for various, uh, you know, biological uh, conditions, various tissues and cell types. And the uh, data sets themselves are stored in a variety of formats and uh, uh, described in often uh, data source specific uh, metadata schemas. Um, so all of these uh, uh, together makes it difficult to um, query, compare and aggregate uh, site functional genomics data across data sources. And uh, in general, it makes it uh, challenging to integrate this data into uh, new or existing workflows. Um, Filer uh, is uh, our work aimed at addressing some of these needs uh, by providing a, um, a harmonized collection of uh, uh, many uh, functional genomics data uh, integrated across uh, uh, many data sources. Over, uh, over 20 data sources, uh, uh, providing a total uh, uh, genomic coverage of over 2,000 fold and capturing a variety of biological conditions uh, with over 1,000 tissue and cell types. Importantly, all of this data uh, is uh, uh, consistently uh, annotated uh, with extensive metadata. Uh, all of these data sets are uh, uniformly processed uh, into bad based uh, formats. Uh, and uh, all of the data is uh, uh, organized in uh, ontology driven uh, uh, way uh, into uh, smaller data collections such as 25 enhancers, roadmap enhancers, or encode uh, uh, histone uh, uh, chip seq data or encode DNA seq uh, data. And uh, importantly, all, all of this data is uh, coupled with. Uh, uh, Apache Spark and Giggle uh, genomic indexing based uh, API to allow for scalable uh, access to this uh, large scale data. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, this uh, pie chart uh, shows the uh, data composition of the first version of Filer. Uh, and uh, as we can see here, the fi Filer includes uh, data from uh, ENCODE, the uh, latest ENCODE phase three uh, includes uh, data from GTEx, uh, NIH uh, Roadmap Epigenomic Project, uh, Phantom Project, and so forth. And these data are um, uh, covering uh, over 30 different experimental data types, including ChIP-seq, DNA-seq, ATTACK-seq, as well as uh, expression and splicing QTL data. Uh, and uh, 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 like I said, uh, this, all of this data can be scalably queried. And shown here is the uh, uh, illustration of uh, uh, using filer of uh, 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 data to and overlapping with uh, 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 genetic variants or structural variants, uh, variant sets uh, of various sizes. And as we can see here, um, the um, uh, filer allows for highly parallelizable access that scales linearly with the number of cores as indicated uh, on the x axis, as we scale from 60 to 96 cores, the source speed, uh, the y axis uh, uh, is increasing uh, linearly. So, uh, uh, to sum up, uh, Filer uh, provides a, a harmonized functional genomic data uh, collection across many over 20 data sources, uh, including ENCODE. And uh, all of this uh, uh, data uh, can be scalably accessed. Uh, Filer can be accessed through the web uh, interface or deployed on uh, your local server or in the cloud environment. Uh, and we hope this, will, this flexibility also will make Filer a go-to um, place for functional genomics data. And I would like to wrap up by thanking all the people who contributed to this work as well as the funding agencies. Thank you for your attention. 
I'm Lance Henches, and today I'm going to talk to you about the Lancetron Peak Color. Chromatin profi profiling assays, like ATT&CK, CHIP, and DNA-Seq, uh, work by selectively pulling down DNA fragments, which are then aligned to a corresponding reference genome. Areas of interest are identified by their increased fragment density uh, through the use of a peak color, uh, which typically works by applying some statistical test. Uh, generally, real peaks are enriched to the point of statistical significance, uh, but the occurrence of false positives in peak calls is a well-known problem. Uh, there are techniques to mitigate this, FDR, IDR. Uh, they can remove some false positives, uh, running multiple replicates for experiments. Uh, but these solutions aren't perfect and work better in some situations than others. So how can you tell uh, noise from a biological event if they're both statistically significant? Uh, well, you have to visualize your data. Uh, the two peaks shown here come from the same track, are shown at the same scale, and have the exact same p-value. But to my eye, the peak on the right looks much better. Uh, in fact, several studies have shown that humans are good at calling peaks by sight, and can do so reliably and repeatedly. Obviously, this is not feasible genome-wide, uh, but we wanted to create a peak caller to address the false positive problem, and this idea was really critical to our design. So when we were planning our new peak caller, we decided to use peaks labeled by humans to teach a deep learning algorithm what a peak looks like. We got these data from ENCODE, which as you know, has a varied and extensive collection of experiments to work with. Uh, deep learning has been shown to outperform humans when it comes to things like image classification or pattern recognition. Uh, so we applied it uh, to peak calling uh, when we did so in concert with traditional statistical testing. Uh, in this way, Lancetron assesses more than just the height of a peak it considers the actual shape of the region. Benchmarking has shown it to be extremely accurate at identifying known peaks, uh, over 99% accuracy. Uh, visualization is really important to understanding a data set, so we wanted to have that built in. After uploading your data, your results are mapped to a genome, uh, and histograms of peak stats, as well as fully customizable uh, and interactive uh, charts are loaded automatically. We also wanted to have a web interface. This meant users had no software to install. When you upload your file, the actual computations happen on Oxford's machine learning cluster. Uh, so I'm actually going to do a quick demo showing a track from ENCODE. Uh, down here, this is the link. Uh, I'll put it up on Slack when this goes live. So this is a track from uh, Histone Mark H3K27 on the cell line 22 RV1. I think that's a prostate cancer cell line. Um, so there are a number of ways to interact with your, your data. Um, we can see uh, basically down here is a genome browser. This functions as you'd sort of expect it to. Uh, typically, uh, the output of a peak caller is a bed file. Uh, the table on the right here functions as an interactive bed file. So clicking on a row takes you to that location. Um, in the genome browser, you can filter and sort columns here on the fly. Uh, you can look at uh, the table with thumbnails, or you can actually just look at the images themselves. Uh, on the left here are interactive charts, uh, and all these pieces are connected. So charts uh, will update your uh, table or images down over here. Uh, these things are also updating uh, the tables around here, or sorry, the, the genome browser down here. Uh, so everything is, is uh, interactive and connected. And you may have spotted this already, um, but if we take a look at the peak score, and this is the scoring generated uh, from the deep learning algorithm, you can see there's actually quite a few low scoring regions uh, that you probably want to filter out. We can see from the, the thumbnails uh, that these things are probably uh, not what you want. Um, and maybe you think this is low resolution data or something like that, but actually it's the exact opposite. Uh, this is an extremely good experiment. The peaks shown here were even called in two biological replicates. This is actually an intersection of two peak calls made with MAX2. Uh, so I think this just goes to show that peak calling is not a solved problem yet. Uh, and I think Lancetron can be a useful tool uh, for improving your data analysis. Um, there are many more features to explore, but I have to leave it here. Uh, do uh, take a look if you're curious. Also be on the lookout for a bioarchive paper in the coming weeks. Um, there were so many people that have been critical to this project. I want to highlight the vision grant for funding, supervisors Steve Taylor and Jim Hughes, as well as my collaborator, uh, Martin Sargent. Uh, thank you for your time.
Hello everyone, my name is Christophe Fab and I'm a PhD student in bioinformatics in Dr. Steve Biotto's lab in collaboration with Dr. Arnaud Droit at the Université Laval in Quebec City, Canada. Today I will present my research project that deals with the regenerative transitional response to glucocorticoid stimulation. Transcription involves the interplay of multiple factors as the transcription factors that will bind to regulatory elements. This will include transcriptional co-regulators and the RNA polymers too at core promoters in order to enable transcription. Transcription and the chromosome architecture are closely related. Folding of the genome is not random and we can distinguish several layers of folding. Each chromosome occupies a specific area within the nucleus, which are called chromosome territory. At a smaller scale, we can distinguish compartments A and B, then we have the TAD. TAD stands for topologically associating domains and are domain of preferential chromatin interactions between regulatory elements. Through the project, we explore the transcriptional regulation in the context of the 3D genome, following a hormonal stimulation. The stimulation is induced by the dexamethasone that diffuses through the membrane, binds to the glucocorticoid receptor that will translocate to the nucleus. Then, GR binds to the DNA in order to activate and replace its target. We use several types of available link sequencing data and encode as GIFSIC to identify the binding site of GR and transcriptional co-regulators. RNA-seq at several time points, and IC data to have the position of the TAD on the genome. Our preliminary analysis showed that among differentially expressed genes, about half of DEX responsive genes have a GR binding. So we were wondering how DEX responsive genes, without any evidence of regulations by GR, are regulated. This led us to the following hypothesis. In addition to direct regulation by absorption factors, the position of a gene within the 3 genome is an important determinant of we will first be interested in the NGPTL4 gene, which is a known activity target of DEX stimulation. Tracks represent the binding site of GR and several cofactors, MED1, BRD4, and CDK9, before and after the stimulation. Here we can observe a gain of GR and cofactors after stimulation in the neighborhood of the NGPTL4 gene. Further analysis showed that gains and losses of cofactors are correlated across the genome. Then we counted the number of gains and losses per set and attributed the score to each TAD using the formula at the top right corner. Here we can observe that TADs are biased towards gains or losses. We are here in a particular TAD that contains several genes. We can observe the gain of GR and cofactors at the promoter of CHD16 genes as the well as an activation in terms of transcription. However, at the promoter of RID genes, we noticed a not absence of GR and cofactors. But RID expression follows CHD16 transitional kinetic without any direct regulation by GR. This suggests that RID expression is induced because of the position in the TAD with only gains of cofactors. This heat map shows the full change of differential expression at one and two hours. This set of genes have an evidence of regulation by the transition factors GR. While annotating those genes with gains and losses of cofactors, we observe the correlation between activation and gains and the repression and losses of cofactors. While evaluating the cofactor activity of the TAD the gene belong, we observe an arrangement of induced genes within activated TAD and replaced genes within replaced TAD. So there is a correlation between the transcriptional response and the TAD activity for GR bound genes. While looking at genes not bound by GR, we can do the same. Here, we evaluated the changes in expression of genes depending on the TAD activity. We observed that in repressed TADs, genes are repressed and in the same way, induced genes are in activated TADs. While looking at GR not bound genes, we are doing the same observation. So we observe that distribution of changes in RNA expression is similar in biased TADs, no matter the GR bound. In summary, we saw that GR elicits a regionalized redistribution of cofactors. TADs are biased towards gains or losses of cofactors and that the position of a gene within bias that correlates with the transcriptional response following glucocorticoid stimulation. These results suggest that the position of a gene within responsive TAT is an important determinant of the transcription. Finally, the model we suggest is as follows. We are in a TAT that contains several genes that are expressed at the basal level. After stimulation, GR will bind at the neighborhood of the gene, recruit some cofactors and the polymerase too, in order to activate the expression of the gene. What we are suggesting is that it is a local accumulation of cofactors, is transitional condensate, that allows genes in the chromatin environment to be activated. 
I would like to thank some of the people that are involved in that project. I would like to thank the Infant Consortium for making available genomic data for the scientific community. And thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Ben Katwadi, and I'll talk about Trendco, our efficient topological associated domain aware regulatory network construction tool. We'll talk a little bit of the goal of the, model, the algorithm and the model that we generated, and then we'll talk about how we implemented this um, and used ENCODE data for it. So we used, uh, we all know that regulatory networks are powerful tools and many people use different genomic data to generate these regulatory networks to find differences in um, developmental time points or between normal tissue and a disease state um, to really find driver um, genes and novel regulators. So the common model that many people use is a very linear model. They only find enhancers, um, look at those transcription factor motifs, um, and then develop the network by using a distance matrix on a linear base. So the closer you are to a gene and promoter and enhancer, those transcription factors that drive that promoter um, will have a higher weight. However, we all know that the genome is quite complex. We have nucleosomes, chromatin loops, individual loops that are very variable, and TAD chromatin compartments as well as uh, LADs. So what we're here looking at is we decided we were going to take TADs and incorporate that into our um, model. So what we did is we added TADs and we looked at gene expression data and enhancer data, and we chose these two as our um, enhancer data by H3K27, and we chose these two models as one uh, they're very uh, ab abundant, and two, they um, easily developed by uh, used by many people, and we can always add more data to the model as well. Our thoughts were so the model, as you can see, it looks very similar to our previous slides. However, we add a tad boundary here in green, and this um, stops people. It stops us in the model to say that genes, the uh, enhancers that cross this uh, tad boundary are not actually part of the weight. So that means this we, in, in prime example, this delta transcription factor cannot control itself and create this loop red. So the core to the algorithm is taking enhancer lo locations and calling the um, enhancer um, expression by um, log TPM. And then we call gene expression. We call motifs on the promoters as well as on the enhancers and using those transcription factors um, and distances within a TAD, we then create a transcription factor motif by gene matrices here. And that becomes the whole network. So for our test data, we took the heart ENCODE data because it has won a wealth of time points and it's well studied on what's potential drivers of those cardiac development. So when taking all the heart data and development time points, we find that transcription factors show time point activation, or we highlight here FOXS1. So FOXS1 in our model, we're looking at these weights here in the heat map um, between nodes, between each of these nodes. And so FOXS1 over time is driving the expression of these genes and has higher weight over time. This is highly, um, we can really see this in the inflection time point graph here, where if we look at the time point to, compared to the previous time point, that we had um, these weights really increase around 15 and a half, 16 and a half, and then at zero and eight weeks, these weights really drop and go the opposite and are less important um, as, as uh, we go into the adult stage. So then we take a look at this across multiple different um, transcription factors, GATA4, MEF2A, NK25, TBX5, which are canonical um, transcription factors people are looking at. Um, Fox S1, what did you talk about? SRF. And here in SRF, we see that these weights are really low in embryonic, but as we hit uh, birth and adult, that's where we see the weights of the SRF really changing. So we looked at previous studies that showcase this uh, networks and did a comparison. And when we compare this, we find large overlaps with our networks and previous networks. And these 165 uh, targets that we do not find is um, when we investigate or due to our TAD boundary um, that we put in. Our network is also broader 
um, when we look at Go annotations of what these what we're targeting here, and this allows us to um, this, to investigate this further and truly capture the biology. Um, when we look at the whole network for 10.5 and 8, 5, 8 weeks for GATA4, we really see this is driving embryonic tissue development versus um, circulation. So in conclusion, we capture extensive network connections. Um, we identify time-dependent changes in transcription factor interactions and the processes that they're controlled by. Um, and then we have high overlap with already published uh, networks from previous studies. I would really like to thank uh, Chris Bennett, who's been driving driver for this project. Viren Amen, who um, started the project and has